welcome to the Dementia Researcher Podcast, brought to you by University College London and the NIHR in association with Alzheimer's Research UK, Alzheimer's Society, Race Against Dementia and the Alzheimer's Association, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hi everyone, um, so I'm Dr. Chi Ude Momo and I'm a translational neuroscientist based across Imperial College in London, um, Karolinska Institute in Sweden and Aga Khan University in Kenya. It's my pleasure to be hosting this special episode recorded on location from the AIC Satellite Symposium and, I'm co and it's co-hosted by the Global Brain Health Institute in the very exotic Mexico City. So these events were started by the Alzheimer's Association a few years ago, and essentially they're a light version of their big international conference. So they put a focus on issues and research taking place in particular parts of the world, and they work to improve accessibility in areas where researchers may not easily be able to afford to attend you know, the bigger international events like the AIC com um, conference coming up soon um, in Amsterdam. So for our regular listeners, you'll know how these highlight podcasts work, but for any newbies, it's a pretty simple format. I'm joined by four amazing researchers who have been attending this event, um, say so the Global Brain Health Institute um, Conference, as well as the AIC Satellite Symposium, and they're gonna share their highlights. They're gonna summarize some of the talks, the posters and takeaways, and, and the aim is, essentially to keep you in the loop, even if you couldn't attend. Um, I know there was um, some people able to attend virtually, but the GBHI conference was in person only. But we hope to be able to share some of the work of the brilliant researchers, including those um, joined, um, joining me here, working across all areas of discovery, particularly around brain health and dementia. So let's meet the guests. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Adolfo Garcia, Michelle Moses Essenstein, Dr. Alison Kanti, and Dr. Jayshree Dasgupta. Say hello, everyone. Um, I'm hoping to just start with some introductions, and we can go around the tables um, to do some introductions. So, um, Adolfo, would you like to go first? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm the director of the Cognitive Neuroscience Center at the Universidad de San Andres in Argentina. Uh, a senior Atlantic fellow at the Global Brain Health Institute and a researcher at um, Universidad de Santiago de Chile. And basically I work at the interface of language science and cognitive neuroscience. And the main thing that uh, we do with our teams is to try to leverage our knowledge about the connections between speech, language and the brain to try to see if we can find markers, signatures, clues into the integrity of different brain regions, networks and mechanisms based on people's speech behavior. Excellent. Thank you so much, Adolfo. And um, Michelle? Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm Michelle Moses Eisenstein. I'm not a doctor, but I'd love to play one on TV at some point. Um, my background is health policy and advocacy, as well as government. And in my more personal capacity, not professionally trained, um, I really enjoy community musical theater. So I also identify as a performing artist. Awesome. Alison? Thank you, Chi. I'm Alison Canty. I am a fellow of the Global Brain Health Institute, but usually I'm based in Hobart at the Wicking Dementia Research and Education Centre at the University of Tasmania. And in my role there, I do research into neuroplasticity, looking at how the connections of the brain change during ageing and in neurodegenerative diseases like dementia, and looking at ways to try and restore the plasticity that's lost in the disease processes. And I'm also an educator. We run some really large online programs to try and reach those who need to know about dementia. Excellent, thank you. And Jayshree. Hi, Chi, thanks a lot for having me. Um, I'm Jayshree Dasgupta, and I'm currently an Atlantic Fellow at um, the Global Brain Health Institute at Trinity College, Dublin. Um, but I'm a neuropsychologist and a social entrepreneur from India. So the work that I do is really around trying to build services for people. Um, in the areas of mental health, as well as dementia care. And a lot of the work that I'm doing is around improving awareness about these conditions, um, advocacy for this, as well as trying to really understand how we can support carers and mm. leverage the local knowledge in these places to provide support where you don't have services to meet the needs of the hour. Brilliant. Thank you. So let's get to the highlights, because which I'm sure our viewers are hoping to hear about. Um, Alison, would you like to go first? Sure, thanks, Chi. Well, I was really interested in how the program was put together to really set the scene 
for this part of the world and in Latin America. In the first session of the AAIC conference, we really started with hearing about the World Health Organization's sort of global action plan for dementia. And it was nice that we then went down into um, Latin American situations and which countries have a plan, which ones are planning their plans, and which countries don't have any plan or have made no progress towards the goals of having a dementia plan. Then we moved into the Mexican situation and we found out about the dementia plan here and how it's going, how it's being implemented and the challenges being experienced in this context and this part of the world. And what was striking for me at the end is we heard from someone with personal experience, the lived experience of dementia as a carer for someone in this part of the world. And that was really striking for me. And as the conference continued, it was really good to see how the, the countries are all starting to work together and we're hearing about uh, collaborations that are occurring across the countries as we work towards implementing these dementia plans and really collaborative approaches. Excellent, yeah. I'm really intrigued also to hear Michelle's perspective, especially from a non-scientist um, <laughs> background. So please, if you'd like to yeah, go next. Sure. Well, what you said really resonates, um, especially in terms of the caregiver perspective. And I think one place where we really saw that, and maybe I'm biased because I'm also an Atlantic fellow, based with Chi in San Francisco, and we're not that far from Los Angeles. I love a good film. And for anyone who was at Keys Bags Names Words, the screening, I know Iris was there, it was fantastic. Um, it, it blew me away. I hope everyone mm. gets a chance to see it. Yeah. And I think what I really took away is that you know, the leadership space of global brain health equity is consistently academic, consistently clinical, consistently scientific, and a place of problem solving. Yeah. And it's very challenging. I mean, this isn't a surprise to anyone. This is the human experience. It's such a challenge to be vulnerable. Yeah. And somehow they got these people in front of a camera who are either people living with dementia or their care partners, and they gave them this empowered space. and. It's a compilation of just really powerful stories and, of course, the experts like my mentor, Dr. Leah Grinberg, and, and her lab at UCSF. And um, you can sign up at the website if you want to learn more about it. Uh, I believe it's bags, excuse me, keysbagsnameswords.com. That's where they're going to send uh, more information mm -hmm. through their listserv about the upcoming screenings. But that absolutely blew me away. And it's just wonderful, beautiful stories that I think through their own vulnerability give a voice to others to tell mm. more stories. Awesome. And yeah, that? what I found really remarkable about that, that movie was <coughs> it was lots of narratives, lots of stories all woven together, but it's the same stories occurring across the whole world. Yes. It's not unique to a particular place. We're all experiencing, you know, this same... You know, it was nice experiencing the, the same effects of learning how to care for someone with dementia and to really have that as an empathy-driven approach to sharing those stories mm -hmm. was what was really heart-touching for me. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think it also speaks to the need for interdisciplinary or even multidisciplinary and collaborative approaches. We can't only do science and medical me, um, and medicine without thinking about the arts, because I think that was like really, really powerful at driving the message on the advances, but all the challenges as well um, of dementia patients that we're all working towards. So um, Jashri, do you want to go next? Sure, I mean, I think, Overall, the, the, the conference experience was fantastic because unlike, well, it's the first conference I've attended in person for a while, yes. and it was just amazing to have the opportunity to interact with people whom I've reached out um, to over email and, you know, kind of seen on Zoom, um, you know, over the past pandemic years. And mm -hmm. I think that's been my biggest mm -hmm. highlight, really. I mean, the scientific sessions and everything were, were fantastic, but mm -hmm. just getting to actually meet people who are doing such fantastic work um, and talk to them uh, has been a real draw for me. What, what I thought was really interesting though about the, the conference was that the whole, just the way that all these different countries in Latin America are working together yes. um, and to see that entire body of work and you know the sense of collaboration is absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, and of course, each scientific session had very specific um, scientific outputs 
But what was more interesting as a researcher in the field who's kind of trying to do some of this work was to actually hear about the challenges that people are yes. facing and the opportunity to mm -hmm. discuss this one-on-one -on -one or through yeah. the breakouts. And I think I, yeah. I, I personally learned a lot from those interactions as well. So that was fantastic. Exactly. Adolfo? What did yeah. you think? Well, the main highlight, of course, is this podcast, right? I mean, it's a real purpose of the whole week. It's, uh, exactly. Having you here, host, and making you blush with this Oh, my word. It doesn't get any better than this. But uh, I, I, I'll say I will uh, echo the thoughts about the importance of integrating the arts into what we do. Yeah. That was actually something that cut across the program proper with the brain boosts, right? Mm. So between some of the main sessions, there was... Uh, an opportunity for some fellows to actually engage in dynamic uh, creativity based creativity driven activities that involve music dance um, I think that's that's very good not just because we believe in the power of art to contribute to our, over, our overarching mission but just because of the mindset that it puts you in before um, uh, a talk right just create a right a right mm -hmm. mind space for that um, diversity was a running theme but it was also something that uh, was incarnated in everything that happened. If you just take a walk around the posters, mm -hmm. um, you will see that they have been produced by people who come from backgrounds as diverse as yes. cinema, yes. the world of music, mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know, geriatrics. You have, of course, your, um, your run-of-the-mill scientists, yeah, yeah? Um, so we have to do that. Yeah. But there are also um, uh, crossings with the world of technological development, startups, networks. So that was very, very um, interesting to see. Uh, the topics that were addressed really were uh, focusing on the, 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 the hot spots uh, of, of discussion nowadays. Anything ranging from biomarkers to education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and with a really, um, I should say, uh, intersectional or transdisciplinary approach mm -hmm. where you can see the, the the whole gamut of aspects that cut across from ranging from our genes and the alleles of the genes to the neuroanatomy of the diseases that we are interested in learning about to the sociocultural milieus in which all of us operate. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that was um, fantastic and the final thing I'll mention is the eagerness even the urge from everybody to collaborate. Yes. I'm going to echo what, you, what mm -hmm. you said, but it's something that you could also feel uh, during the breaks. I mean, everybody was uh, as eager to reach the breaks as they were to listen to the sessions just because it was the right time yeah. to network and to make your life easier than it is. <laughs> uh, but uh, we all know and we hope for the good reason. Yeah. I mean, thank you so much um, for, for rounding up. I think, you know, definitely... I, I have to say the brain boosts were one of my favorite activities as well. And it just really helped, again, to kind of like put you in that frame of mind to receive more. Um, there's obviously excellent food. I don't know how no one mentioned that. But I've eaten <laughs> so much this week. I wanted to go. I would just, I would just you don't want to be a, yeah, be a foodie. Yeah. You know, yeah. Speaking of access and health equity, oh, I think we had access to mole every day. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, but I should also speak to the diversity of the panel yeah. as mm -hmm. well. I don't know whether that was intentional, but I really want to commend, um, you know, the organizers. I noticed there was, a, you know, a, a running theme around gender balanced um, panels, and that really um, that that resonated with, with me, anyways. So thank you guys so much. I mean, we can talk about these highlights forever, but I just wanted to hear from each of you of something that really stood out, like. Uh, and it could be in, in aligned with your research or your work, but what what was that t like message, or, or or talk or session that just really stood out for you? Shall I start? Yes, please. So, Chi, for me, um, one of the messages we heard earlier in the week was really think about how you can change the narrative and to change your language that you use so that you can reach the right people each time and just to be prepared to communicate in the language of the people that you're speaking with. And that's you know, a really important message for all of us as scientists or as educators or as clinicians to speak the language of the audience so that they understand. And another quote that I heard during the week which really resonated with me was to feel the fear and then do it anyway. <laughs> Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, 
Tracy Naledi or uh, yes, it was. Oh. Uh, yes, yeah. from South I'm, Africa. I'm definitely like that. Feel that's now fear. my motto. Feel the fear and, and do it anyway. Keep going. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Sure. So I love what everyone said about the arts and the importance there, and. Um, I'll say, you know, the lightning rounds, or what do we call them, lightning poster sessions, yeah. which you didn't actually have lightning. If, if you haven't watched them yet and you were at all concerned, uh, no actual lightning was used in the creation of these of these lightning rounds. It was very safe, very okay. safe. I think it's because of like the speed, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's funny, like if you come from, if you haven't attended all of these scientific conferences and you're here in lightning rounds, you expect like some special effects. <laughs> yeah, right, with all the theatrical, you know, we have yeah. a lot of actors exactly. in the hotel Point for this session. I see, you know. next conference. <laughs> um, recommending. Yeah, Ver Veronica Rojas really blew me away. Because uh, she talked about, you know, the incredible work that she's been doing mm -hmm. as an artist, mm -hmm. uh, the dignity and, and really the breaking through the barrier of stigma that she's been able to accomplish to date, as well as some new partnerships that she's doing with the De Young Museum in San Francisco is really cool. And then most importantly, maybe I'm biased because my background is health policy, she closed with advocating for the importance of funding, because as we all know, mm. ideas are wonderful, um, but without funding, what do we really accomplish? And I think it was just a beautiful showcase on the power of the arts as a non-pharmacological tool, uh, which really resonated with me because my research is about expanding access to music very broadly, as well as a focus on expanding access to neurologic music therapy mm. in both nursing homes and community settings. Mm -hmm because neurologic music therapy is evidence-based. And I think the best example that I've heard recently was you know, for you could have a patient, you're um, trying to work with aphasia and maybe you know, with the left brain um, and atrophy, atrophy, excuse me, they may have lost their ability to speak verbally, but the right side of the brain is still able to help them communicate through music. Mm -hmm. And that's something that a certified um, music therapist can do just in really three simple steps and it's life changing. And yeah. if we can, you know, get more people to support the work that Veronica's doing, the music therapists and non pharmacological tools, mm -hmm. the results would be cost savings and just healthier people. So it's really inspiring to see, as you all said, the the space that this meaning created for the arts mm -hmm. and the dignity that it can really bring. Absolutely. Thank you. That was beautifully said. Thanks. Don't yeah, um, I think uh, the one thing that stood out for me for me is uh, a question that remains unresolved, and it um, concerns um, education as a, oh, as a yes. variable. Mm -hmm. So usually we try to factor that away when we are forming our groups. You know, we try to yeah. make sure that uh, your your patient group is uh, matched with your controls in terms of education, so that you can rule out the influence of, uh, of that factor. Mm -hmm. All right, fair enough. The discussion was set forth today regarding the diversity of educational systems, exactly. even intra-regionally. So yeah. just if you take a look at Latin America, I mean, how many years of uh, primary school and how many years of mm -hmm. uh, high school, you know, mm -hmm. are uh, compulsory in the different educational systems across countries, that varies a lot. So it was interesting to see that it's not the number um, uh, of years of education yeah. that seems to account for uh, ultimate uh, behavioral performance and uh, brain behavior connections, but actually the completion of certain educational milestones. Yes. So, you know, having completed primary school or high school, irrespective of the number of years. Mm. And uh, a very uh, nice idea was, was uh, made explicit today by Stephanie, uh, Stephanie yeah. Peña Scudero, yeah. who said that, well, you know, it doesn't really matter how many years of education you had, mm. but if you complete high school, yeah. either after 13 years of education or 10 years of education, depending mm. on your educational system, then you have, you're have you better equipped to apply for better jobs and make more money and have better life chances. And if we're talking about social determinants of health, that's that speaks volumes. But there was one issue that was not discussed. And it's the very nature and validity of the notion of years of education. Because what we do is count the years that a person has been in school. Mm. And that is not tantamount to education. No. Far from it. What exactly. we are really measuring 
is how many years a person has been within enrolled in an educational system. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that they have received. It, it is not a measure of education Absolutely. at all. Absolutely. You don't know how, how much those people have learned. You don't know uh, what proportion of the expected goals of the curricula have mm -hmm. been met. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't even know how, uh, how frequently they attended mm. school. All you know is that for a certain amount of time, they've been enrolled. So uh, I want to take this opportunity to bring this topic up because yeah. I think that it's a, it's a major case of uh, construct invalidity yeah and yeah all the publications out there and i can think of very few that actually escape this are referring to accounting for factoring out measuring or trying to measure the impact of education without actually measuring education you'll be pleased to know that in our group we use years um highest level of education attained so educational attainment rather than years mm -hmm. as our code rate for education so i was really in, um, excited to hear you know when stephanie also put it within the context of social determinants of health thank you so much adolfo mm -hmm. let's confess that we had rehearsed this i was just you know giving <laughs> you the right no 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 yeah. absolutely <laughs> wasn't rehearsed but it's great that we're thinking you know along the same lines jai shri please no, great. I mean, I absolutely echo what you were saying. This was actually yeah. one of the discussions that I, I thought really stood out for me because mm -hmm. um, I, th I think I want to kind of highlight um, that it's not just about the years of education, but the quality of education. Mm -hmm. That it's a, we really need to think about how we can measure that more effectively. Mm -hmm. This is an area that I've been trying to think about and work with, um, and some of my work is, you know, people, parents talk about the need for more quality education in low and middle mm. income countries. Mm. They recognize that this is something which is important. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to say we need to get more people to think about that because it's not just a tick box in terms of yes. providing free access to schooling. Yeah. It's really about what goes into teaching. Mm. And it was great to see that there were posters talking about even including um, education about brain health, because mm. that's what we really need to do. Mm. Um, so I think that that's something which we Def was definitely a highlight for me, so I'm glad we're, glad we're using this opportunity to discuss it. But, but, but the challenges are multifarious, even if you're actually measuring uh, uh, outcomes or, or attainment or ultimate attainment, mm. because the truth is that, uh, at least for some educational systems that I'm, that I'm familiar with, you cannot trust the, the grades, you mm. cannot trust the scores, because governments are, are under such pressure to falsify mm. the scores that they report for international assessments, I don't want to say this is, this is happening everywhere, but this is happening. You feel free to be controversial. So, oh, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, no, but I, I really do mean it because I think that we all have a general um, understanding, which paradoxically enough is based on this bogus oper operationalization of the construct. But we know that education accounts for, for a wide uh, proportion of the variance in your, in your cognitive outcomes mm -hmm. uh, and your neurobiological uh, mechanisms and whatnot. Um, but how do we really bridge uh, that gap and how do we really find measures of attainment that are reliable? Great question. And I wonder, on the, while we're on this topic, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll be quite brief, but I wonder whether where we keep thinking about crystallized education, we forget about fluid intelligence. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's another thing um, that um, for, for the viewers to contemplate. Um, you know, because there are, you know, we, we use education, educational attainment, occupational complexity as our metrics of, for instance, cognitive reserve. But I really liked a question that was posed, um, you know, during um, those sessions around the fact that, well, what are we really measuring with the construct education? in itself. We might be missing out a whole different um, form of intelligence that's promoting reserve. But yeah, thank you all so much. Um, I just, I, I really don't think we can, if, if, I, if I may, I just want to, in, in, in a minute or so, just really talk about, you know, one session that was fire for me, which was the GBHI session on intersectionality that was led by our, form, uh, our, our, our fellow Dr. Marianella Ilanes. Um, and it just really resonated with like, you know, there were common themes ar around gaps and challenges, thinking about intersectionality in dementia research, but more importantly, some methodological considerations that were described by um, another fellow as well, Dr. Tanisha Hill-Jarrett, in her introductory 
talk and that that was quite interesting because um you know we we'd already during the gbhi conference as you know had all of these um talks around um you know leadership um glo local and global leadership approaches to brain health equity you know that with you know um tracing a lady but also professor anna luisa sosa um and professor luis miguel um you know where where um gave that excellent keynote but i i think that my absolute favorite session i guess maybe um again like michelle um i think that given you know a lot of the research that i do around um, dementia prevention i was so blown and thinking about multi-partner consortium i was so blown by the work being done in latin america with red lats that um um, Iban, um, uh, um professor iban has talked about um uh, and latin fingers and i really love maria carillo's comments and i hope that they re they take this you know um, into consideration, talking about the need for collaborative work within these high consortium partners should really be taken seriously. So I'm hoping to hear um, more about the excellent work going on in the research uh, in the region. But um, before we wrap up, we should mention, um, and I'm sure we've done so already, but that all of us have one thing in common. We're all Atlantic Fellows for Equity in Brain Health. And as the new call for applications for 2023 has just I can't even believe it's already open. I was speaking to our director, Dr. Victor Valcor, like, hang on a second, the call for 2024 is already open, wow. So um, I wonder if I could just ask you all to say in a few, just one sentence, what advice would you give to someone who's thinking of applying? Go for it, take a risk, acknowledge the fears and do it anyway. For me, it's been a fantastic opportunity to broaden my perspectives and horizons and to meet and tap into an amazing network of like-minded people. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, it's been an absolute dream. I'm, I'm not ready for it to end. Um, so two pieces of advice, if that's okay. Um, so one, in your application, make sure you describe how you give back to the communities that you're a part of. And then it's also never too early to come talk to us. So if you go uh, I think to gbhi.org and search for the fellows directory. We all have the similar email addresses yeah. and I'd love to talk with interested applicants and you can just get more kind of customized advice depending on what your background is or what country um, you're coming from. So yeah. I would definitely get, get some custom advice depending on who you see in that fellows directory and what kind of people really resonate with you. Yeah, absolutely. It's all fun. It uh, catapulted my career. Uh, absolutely. Same. Uh, mm -hmm. But in very, very concrete, non-abstract ways, like just giving me access to 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 data sets, uh, to expertise, to grantsmanship mm -hmm. that that I needed to really hone, mm -hmm. and uh, as a result of that, the access to uh, funding opportunities that mm -hmm. were just beyond my wildest dreams. Uh, so I guess if I had, if I were to give one piece of advice to someone interested in applying. It would be go beyond the curriculum. Do not uh, yeah. restrict your your goals to what GBHI is offering explicitly. Just go beyond that. What's your vision? Mm. Where, where where do you want to go? What what is it that makes you different, distinct? What's your distinct added value, the distinct contribution you can make, and what's the farthest way you can take it? And so factor that into your own personal plan for how you want to leverage the resources. Uh, the expertise, the people who are uh, embedded in this community, because I doubt that you will find a better opportunity to do that. So think yeah. beyond what the program explicitly offers. Excellent. Thank you. Jai Shri. <laughs> um, I, th I think I'm just going to sum it up in one, yeah. one sentence. I, I, it would be dare to dream. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, just I think the, fan, the fellowship has been a fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. um, I've had an opportunity to interact with people whom I might not have interacted with had I not been part yeah. of the fellowship. Yeah. Um, and that's been, it's been an amazing experience to just really start thinking out of the box. Um, the fellowship is an opportunity to really see how you can think of different ideas to solve mm -hmm. mammoth problems. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, a, you know, the, the biggest strength of the fellowship is that it is a network of people who have a shared vision towards exactly. helping each other do that. Exactly. So, exactly. That's, that's I mean, I really love all your comments, and you know, like Adolfo and all of you. I mean, 
GBHR is my lucky charm, um, non-negotiable. I've told this to Bruce Miller and he says, no, you're the luck, um, you know, you're your lucky charm. I'm like, no, GBHR, you have no idea. But yeah, um, I think one addition, I mean, everyone's given amazing advice. And, you know, I also want to just say, you're very, very important um, to collaborate, to really engage with the program, to make those connections. I've made lifelong friends, like literally. So, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And, you know, make those connections, make those, um, forge those collaborations, expand beyond what's an offer. And honestly, the faculty will expand you whether you like it or not. So yeah, um, I wish we could keep talking, but we have a pyramid visit to go to. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not skiving, we promise, it's the end of the conference. Um, but that's all we have time for today. Um, we're gonna rush away, um, catch some sunshine, take some beautiful photos at the pyramids. Um, before we head back to our various locations. But I hope you enjoyed listening. And if you want to find out more about any of the research we discussed, um, just head over to the AIC and GBHI website and you'll find the link in the show notes. I really hope that Adam Smith just uh, um, provides that. So thank you so much to my fabulous guests, Dr. Adolfo, uh, Adolfo Garcia, uh, Michelle Moses Eisenstein, Dr. Alison Kanti, and Dr. Jayashri Dagupta. I'm Dr. Chi Ude Momor, and you've been listening to the Dementia Researcher Podcast. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK, Alzheimer's Society, Race Against Dementia and the Alzheimer's Association. Bringing you research, news, career tips and support.